decision to end Freud's 100-year detour. And the funny thing about it is Seligman has got to be one of the leading lights on the dark side of psychology, investigating our illness and our pathology. He is the guy who pioneered learned helplessness theory, which has to be the bleakest theory in the world. And it's the idea that if I torture you or pick on you or bully you and I do this over and over and over again and there's nothing you can do to stop it, you will give up. You will learn to be helpless. You will just stop fighting back. It's an energy expenditure thing. Again, the body is a homeostatic system, right? It's always trying to save energy. And if you cannot do anything about the fact that you're being tortured every day, you will eventually give up fighting against it learned helplessness theory. And Seligman's the guy who pioneered this really, really dark, dark, dark thinking. But one summer day, middle of the 1990s, he is working in his garden with his young daughter, Nikki. And he has, in his own words, an epiphany. So Seligman is a meticulous, grumpy scientist, a serious grouch by his own description. He's also a serious gardener, really serious. And he is picking up weeds. He's very meticulous with his trawl and he's setting them aside in a neat discard pile. And Nikki, who is all of five years old, is just having as much fun as she possibly can. And weeds are flying up in the air. And Seligman gets pissed off. He starts screaming at Nikki. And Nikki is not having any of it. She stomps over. She's got a stern look on her face. She says, Daddy, I want to talk to you. From the time I was three until the time I was five, I whined a lot. But I decided the day I turned five to stop whining, and I haven't whined once since. If I could stop whining, you can stop being such a grouch. And Seligman decides to take her up on the challenge, and he decides to bring the entire of field of psychology along for the ride. 1998, he becomes president of the American Psychological Association. This is a time where literally one out of ten Americans are taking antidepressants. And his inauguration speech carries really strong echoes of his promise to Nikki and, by the way, Maslow's earlier ideas about psychology – and what he says is the most important thing, the most general thing I have learned was that psychology was half-baked, literally half-baked. We had baked the part about mental illness. We had baked the part about repair of damage. The other side's unbaked, the side of strength, the side of what we're good at, right? The exact same realization Dalai Lama forced on Richie Davidson, Martin Seligman came to through his daughter, Nikki, Right. And as president of the AMA, he gets to choose the central theme for his term. And he chooses positive psychology, which is then a brand new field, writing his first presidential column for the AMA newsletter. I want to remind our field that it has been sidetracked. Psychology is not just the study of weakness and damage. It is also the study of strength and virtue. Treatment is not just fixing what is broken. It is nurturing what is best within ourselves. Big breakthrough comes in 2000. Csikszentmihalyi, godfather of flow psychology, is in Hawaii. So is Seligman. They bump into each other. They drink a ton of gin and tonics. And they write a manifesto for positive psychology that essentially unites the work of William James and Abraham Maslow and Mihai Csikszentmihalyi and Richard Davidson and all these other thinkers. And it's now funneled under this banner positive psychology, right? And one of the interesting things that come out of positive psychology and that starts to wrap all these disparate threads together, and by the way, this is of course the point in the book where the spiritual and the high performance side start to come back together and merge again. And one of the big realizations was that there are three ways to have a good life. You can have a pleasant life, an engaged life, or a meaningful life. Now, a pleasant life is about moment-to-moment -moment happiness, right? How are happy are you right now? How happy are you right now? How happy are you right now? Right? This is a pleasant life. And what they realized and what psychologists have realized for a while is there's not a hell of a lot you can do here. There are little things you can do, and we'll talk about what they are, but as a general rule, there are something called emotional set points. Now, emotional set points are the bandwidth of experience. 
Literally, they get set up sometime in the first nine to 12 years of life. Nobody knows exactly why, where they come from. But what we know is that these set points determine how happy, how sad we will feel over the course of a lifetime. So once they're set up, we will not feel sadder than the sadness set point and we will not feel happier than the happiness set point. And it's pretty much locked up for life. Now, interesting data point, what the research is starting to show is that there are two ways that you actually can alter emotional set points. One, they can go downward. Chronic unemployment or the death of a child will lower your bottom level emotional set point. Those are the two things that will do it. On the upper end, what will raise your emotional set point? Consistent access to non-ordinary states of consciousness is the only way it seems to raise your emotional set point, meaning flow experience after flow experience after flow experience and so forth. But you also seem to have to do the emotional work, right? To do that, you have to integrate the experiences. You don't just get to take a bunch of psychedelics and move up the chain. You have to do the integration hard work on the back end, right? So with the pleasant life version, not a hell of a lot you can do, right? There, As I said, there are some stuff and we're going to come back to that. The next step on the wrong is the engaged life. This is a high flow lifestyle, right? And we're going to talk about what this means in a minute, but the engaged life is a life that has a tremendous amount of flow in it, right? The next step up is the meaningful life. And this is where those high flow activities are in service of something positive and bigger than yourself. And this seems to be the pinnacle of happiness, the best that we can do. And when I think about all this stuff, when I think about what this means for cloud nine and the upper possibility space of human experience, and I think about all the discoveries of positive psychology, I think of their discoveries as baseline high performance. This is like mental health hygiene. It's all the shit that you're a moron to not be doing in really blatant, blunt terms. You're just dumb if you're not deploying these tools in your life because you're making yourself miserable for no reason whatsoever, right? And more importantly, if you are on a spiritual path or a high performance path that is going to involve altered states of consciousness, right? These are fast moving experiences. If you're in a car and you're doing 10 miles an hour, you hit a tree, you dent the fender. You're in a car, you're doing 100 miles an hour, you hit a tree, you've got real problems, right? Altered states of consciousness, these non-ordinary states, whether we're talking about flow states are really serious. I'm not talking about mindfulness based stress reduction, but I'm talking about a serious tantra practice, a serious flow practice, a serious psychedelic practice, or as usually is the case, all these things mixed together into a life. There's a lot of energy moving through that system. And if the foundation isn't stable, if you don't have what I that positive psychology baseline, you're absolutely going to become unmoored, right? Earlier I said, if you've got a spiritual problem, you may need a high performance solution. This is one of those places, right? If you are going on a giant spiritual quest and you don't want to lose yourself along the way, really, really important. So what is that baseline positive psychology recipe? So a couple things to know. First of all, power of positive thinking. So what does that mean? Well, as I said earlier, the amygdala is the brain's danger detector. What that means is your brain takes in about 400 billion bits of information a second. Now, this is the most recent estimate. It comes from a book called The User Illusion. Fantastic, fantastic book on consciousness for anybody who's interested. But 400 billion bits of information a second. Consciousness, stuff you're aware of, the stuff you use to create your reality, 2,000 bits. So the vast majority of what the brain does at the first level is filtered down information, right? And since... The first order of business for any organism is survival. The first stop of all that incoming information has to be an organ that is primed to look for danger. Now, the amygdala technically is primed to look for novelty and salience, but it is 
privileged towards the negative because it's really looking for threats that can keep you alive. And what that means is, this is work that came out of Berkeley, is the amygdala will pick up six to nine bits of negative information for every positive bit that comes through. Research out of positive psychology, by the way, tells us that you need three positive thoughts to counter a negative, right? So one place you got to start is self-monitoring and adjusting self-talk, right? This is critical. Now, more interestingly is the use of gratitude. Gratitude is one of these new agey ideas that have been around forever. Well, now it's a positive psychology idea. And what positive psychology, a baseline high performance recommend is a daily gratitude practice. This means either gratitude list, the standard positive psychology prescription is write down three things you're grateful for and turn one of them into a longer paragraph. I personally believe writing down 10 things you're grateful for is more effective as long as you take the time to really feel that gratitude along the way. I find that's more effective. But the reason you're doing this is you're tilting the brain. The brain will start noticing because when you're grateful, it doesn't set off the brain's bullshit detector. You're not grateful for imaginary things that might happen in the future. You're grateful for stuff that has already happened. It's real. We know it's real, right? I am really grateful I ate dinner last night. I definitely ate dinner last night and being grateful reminds me of the fact that I had this basic need and it got met and it probably is going to get met in the future, by the way. So what happens is with a daily gratitude practice, very quickly, we start to tilt the ratio. We start taking in more positive information. Now, this is fundamental for a lot of things, very fundamental for high performance and creativity because novelty, right? I'm brain is taking in new information or seeing old information, new ways, right? That's the foundation of creativity. You need novel information. If the brain is only hunting the negative, it's not going to find you the stuff that you need, right? Also because of Richie Davidson's work and all the other work at the heart of every positive psychology practice is a mindfulness practice. It's everywhere. And you're doing this for stress reduction and you're doing this to get into that gap, right? There is a gap between when thoughts arise and when we tag them with emotion, right? And emotion is meaning. Once we've tagged a thought with emotion, it's got so much energy, we can't do anything with it. It's already too late most of the time, unless you're a really seasoned meditator. Most of what we want to do is we want to intercept that thought before it gets the emotional weight, right? And that you get from any kind of mindfulness practice. So that's really, really, really fundamental. The final component in the positive psychology recipe, and I think this is really cool, and it is one of the first real flow hacks we're going to talk about. And this comes out of work done by Martin Seligman and a guy named Peterson who's at the University of Michigan. They wrote a book called Character Strengths and Virtues. And what they realized is that if you are interested in living a high flow life, right, you want to make that jump from the first level of I'm happy to an engaged life where there's much more flow. One of the easiest ways to do it is to cultivate your five core strengths. So there's all kinds of strength finding diagnostics available online. Seligman and Peterson have a fantastic one that I really like. But what they basically say is cultivate your five strengths. And if you could find a career that's at the intersection of five strengths, that's a very high flow career. Now we're going to talk about in a couple of seconds why this is the case, why this actually works. But I just want to give you the baseline positive psychology recipe. And I also want you to understand that the reason we have this recipe is earlier we talked about how neuroscience, biotechnology has been accelerating on exponential growth curves. To just put this in perspective for you, biotechnology has essentially been accelerating at five times the speed of Moore's law, which means it doubles in power roughly every four months. And this, at just a health and well-being level, impacts all of us every day. Literally every day you manage to stay alive 
because biotechnology is moving so fast, you gain five hours of life expectancy, no exercise required. Now, all this stuff, all this biotechnology, it's leading to huge breakthroughs. We talked about neural imaging, fMRI, MEG, EEG, all that stuff. But what's also starting to happen is older metrics, physiological metrics, heart rate variability, galvanic skin response, EEG, these are less accurate. And when I say less accurate, what I mean is there's tons of noise in the system. So if I put an EEG headset on you and you yawn or blink, that's going to show up as brain activity, noise. So it's really hard to separate signal from noise in all this research. It's been a problem going all the way back. Enter AI, artificial intelligence, big data, machine learning, neural net. All these things are allowing us to tackle aspects of cloud nine in ways that we've never done before. And where this, I think, is its coolest is on the spiritual side of things. Let me give you an example. So right now you can get online and you can find enormous databases of near-death experiences, global databases. So we can do things we've never been able to do before. It turns out, by the way, that Thai folks and Europeans, very different near-death experiences culture seems to play a role. What you experience is shaped by culture. And now we know this, right? So we can strip out a little more of the near-death experience, sort of the part that was on the mystical side. We didn't understand what it was. There's mystery there. And we can say, oh, look, culture accounts for some of this. We can do that. And we can also find things in this research that science can't explain, right? One of the things that has showed up since they've started doing all this NDE work is lots and lots and lots of people have experiences gain information when they are supposedly technically brain dead about things that they don't know about. There's a really famous study that was done in the Nordic countries by a researcher named Pims von Lommel of people who died in the emergency room and were brought back to life. And the famous example he gives is an old man and and he was dead and they were going to work on him and they took his eyeglasses off his face. He was flatlined and they put it in a medical chest of drawers on the second drawer from the top to his right. And then they revive him. They bring him back to life. A couple days go by and he wants his reading glasses and he asks for them. And nobody can find them. And he says, oh, no, that was because when I was lying on the table, you put them in, in that second drawer, right? This is a scientific study taking place in a hospital. And this stuff happens over and over and over again. So some of this stuff gets explained away using big data. And some of it we go, wow, there's still a mystery here. We don't know what that is. We don't know what's going on. The same thing has been happening with psychedelic experiences. So, for example, you go to places like Arawad, you can put in trip reports, right? I took San Pedro cactus and this was my experience. I took DMT and this was my experience. And what we're getting is, so DMT, for example, produces, as Rick Strassman found out the hard way, really strange, strange, strange experiences. So, for example... I had a DMT experience where one of the things I saw was hieroglyphics in languages I didn't think I spoke or knew. And for 10 minutes, I just saw black and white hieroglyphics moving past my vision or through my field of vision that my eyes were closed, right? Well, turns out that's not very uncommon. In fact, one of the first entries is for the Akashic Record, right? This is the Akashic Record experience. It shows up in mystical literature going all the way back, and it's very common in DMT. So what does this suggest? It suggests there's some biology there. There's something in our brain that makes us see language or see what symbolic representations of things that look like language. What is that exactly? Who knows? But it's everywhere across many, many cultures. Then you go, oh, wow, this is cool. We should use science to take a deeper look at that. By the way, I have a friend who's at Los Alamos who came up with a fabulous DMT experiment to figure out if the information is real or not. So one of the things that is impossible for anybody but a savant to do is to factor large primes. This is the very thing that they give supercomputers to solve. It protects cryptography, right? This is how we encrypt data. And it 
turns out with DMT, you can usually carry one question into the experience. So we haven't done this yet, but the idea is give somebody a large prime to factor somebody without any mathematical training, you know, give it to thousands of people. And if one person comes back with a real answer, now that's interesting because that's something we couldn't find. So then maybe the information is coming from some place more than just the person's imagination, right? So this is really, really cool. We got to use this at the Flow Genome Project. For example, if you go to the website for the Flow Genome Project, www dot flow genome project dot com. You will find a flow profile there. It's one of the largest diagnostic studies ever run in optimal psych. And it's built on Dobby Young's early work, the big five personality type and a bunch of different flow triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow that we're going to talk about in a second. Built the top of both those things. But if you would have asked me 15 years ago, if there was something I would, you know, bet all the money in my wallet on flow wise, I would have said, oh yeah, for sure. The highest flow categories, the flow that is good. We're going to find the most people find flow doing action adventure sports or doing collaborative creative endeavors like playing in a band or, or acting in a theater company or doing improv theater or that sort of thing. That would absolutely, I would have bet every cent I had on that. And it turns out out of the 80,000 people or so who have taken the flow profile, so a big data approach to the problem, the vast majority of people fall into a deep thinker category. They find the most flow doing knowledge work, being doctors, lawyers, architects, engineers, coders, designers, writers, and so forth. So we're starting to gain insights. We're starting to map cloud nine with much finer grain detail than ever before because of big data. And what all this is doing is giving us leverage like never before. And one of the places this leverage shows up the most, and this is where I'm going to spend most of my time, is with flow. So over the past 10 to 15 years, most of the past 10 years, as we've been able to peer deeper and deeper in the brain, figure out where is flow coming from, the next question, the next obvious question, optimal performance, how do I get more of it? What everybody wants to know, right? And here, we've made some really good strides. We now know that flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. Now, there are, based on our research, about 20, 21 of these that have been discovered so far. Now, there are way, way, way more of them. This is just where we are right now. Before I go into those triggers, I need to tell you two things first. One, flow states, as I hinted at earlier, come in a couple of varieties. The most common individual flow, this is me going into a flow state or you going into a flow state, or group flow. This is me and you together going into a flow state. A group flow is a group performing at their very best. And we've all had experiences of group flow. If you've sung in a church choir, if you've played in a band, if you've done improv theater or improv comedy, if you've gone to a concert, right, where the the band comes together with the audience and the music just starts to soar, right? Small group of people, that's group flow. If it's a large group, it's communitas, as I pointed out earlier. All of these are group flow experiences. If you've ever taken part in a great brainstorming session where ideas are just bouncing off the wall, that's group flow. If you've seen a fourth quarter comeback in football, best example I can think of is what the New England Patriots did to the Atlantic Falcons a couple of years ago in the Super Bowl where they scored an ungodly record number of points in the fourth quarter against incredible odds. That's group flow in action, right? So there are, as I said, 20 triggers. And there are individual triggers and there are group triggers. And all these triggers seem to do one of three things that we know of. They probably do more, but this is what we know right now. They either drive norepinephrine or dopamine, which are the brain's two principal focusing chemicals, or they lower cognitive load. Cognitive load is all the stuff you're trying to think about at once. And if I lower that, right, you can pay more attention to the present. And this is not accidental. That is what all these triggers have in common. I said earlier, flow can only show up when all of our attention is in the right here, the right now, right? Intense focus on a limited field of information, right? 
is what drives flow. That's exactly what these triggers do. They drive norepinephrine. They drive dopamine, the brain's two focusing drugs, or they lower cognitive load. They give us less anxiety, less busyness in our head so we can pay more attention to the right here, right now. I'm going to walk you through some of the triggers just so you get a sense of how they work. So on the individual side, right, first couple ones are obvious, passion and purpose. This is simple, right? We pay more attention to those things that we believe in, right? Go all the way back to Nietzsche. What did Nietzsche say? The foundation of high performance was find something you're passionate about, right? Find something that matters. Why does this matter so much? Passion is one of these words that people love to give all kinds of mystical attributes to, and we love to gussy it up. We pay more attention to those things that we believe in. That's why passion works as a flow trigger. We also see risk as a flow trigger, right? Flow follows focus consequences catch our attention. This is one of the reasons there's so much flow in action sports, but it's not just physical risk. It can also be emotional risk. It can be psychological risk. It can be creative risk. It can be social risk. Social risk, in fact, is fantastic for this. Your brain actually can't tell the difference between physical pain and social pain. They're processed in the exact same neuronal structures, which sounds crazy. Like, why the hell would that be? And the reason is, if you screwed up socially, right, go back earlier than 200 years ago, before we sort of have any kind of individuation and women's rights and things along those lines, if you screwed up socially and get kicked out of the tribe, kicked out of the village, kicked out of the town, often that was a fatal problem, right? You don't go wandering off alone in the forest in the 1500s and expect to come out the other side alive. That just wasn't very common. So the brain processes social phobia in the same place. It processes physical phobias. This is why, by the way, that fear of public speaking is the number one fear in the world and not something that would make more sense like fear of getting eaten by a grizzly bear, right? So we can use risk to our advantage to drive flow. The next triggers to consider are novelty, complexity, or unpredictability. These are three things, very similar to risk, by the way, that massively increase the amount of dopamine in our system. In fact, novelty and unpredictability increased dopamine so much, the boost, it's almost as much as produced by cocaine. So it's a huge, huge squirt in dopamine. Novelty is obvious, right? It's encountering new information. It's why, this is why travel produces flow so often, right? You, you switch locations and suddenly there's novelty everywhere and it's a bit of dopamine and a bit of dopamine and a bit of dopamine. It's driving focus and flow. Complexity is what happens when we encounter something that is too complicated for us to process consciously. So when we look up and see the vastness of the night sky, right, and suddenly we're struck by awe, right, reality seems to pause for just a second, what's really happening is the brain is short-circuiting and saying, holy crap, I can't process this much vastness with a working memory that can hold seven items at once, and it sort of kicks it over to the adaptive unconscious to deal with it, and we experience it as awe. It's the front end of a flow state, right? Unpredictability, same thing. I don't know what's going to happen next, right? Brain loves that. The next flow trigger is called deep embodiment. Deep embodiment is a really simple idea, and it's the idea that we pay the most attention to the present, the moment at hand, when multiple sensory streams are engaged in the present, right? This is why learning through doing trumps everything else. Because, you know, don't just read about the windmill, go out and build one. It's not just engaging your eyes while reading, it's engaging your hands, your senses, vestibular awareness, all ears, smell, all of that gets woven in, drives attention into the now. So we also have three really famous psychological triggers, immediate feedback, clear goals, and the challenge skills balance, which I sort of broke down for you way back when. And I'll go into more detail as we go along. And there's also a creative 
trigger for flow. This is built on top of pattern recognition. So whenever we recognize a pattern, we get a little squirt of the feel-good neurochemical dopamine. So we've had this experience. You've done a crossword puzzle. You've done Sudoku, right? When you get an answer right, that little rush of pleasure, that's dopamine, right? That's pattern recognition. In fact, this creative trigger, it's interesting. Remember when we started this whole thing out, I told you the story about action sport athletes in the 90s and suddenly, you know, everything's going through the roof and was accelerating wildly and what the hell is going on? A couple things went on. One, action sport athletes started to live in a way that they were building their lives around these triggers. They were living in communities of practice, right? Same thing you would find in a monastery or an ashram for meditation practice. They were living in Jackson Hole, Wyoming or Squaw Valley, California or Whistler. And there were a couple other spots. These were communities of practice built essentially around these individual flow triggers. But the big difference and what really changed is in the 90s, you got the free movement in action sports. So up until that moment, right, if you wanted to a career as a professional skier, you were a racer, fastest man or fastest woman to the bottom wins. And that was it. No novelty, no complexity, no unpredictability, no creativity, no pattern recognition. Do the same thing really, really well, right? In the 90s and moving to the thousands, suddenly people are free surfing. They're free riding, free skiing. What that means is outside the bonds of competition, these are expression sessions. And suddenly creativity became the most prized value. It wasn't fastest guy down the mountain, fastest girl down the mountain who won the race. It was the most creative interpretation of the terrain. And by creatively interpreting the terrain over and over and over again, they were pumping them filled with dopamine from the pattern recognition, from the novelty, from the complexity, from the unpredictability, the amount of time they were spending in flow went through the roof as a result of this. Group triggers to switch sides, we see things like complete concentration in the present moment, another individual trigger, right? And instead of clear goals on the individual trigger side, we get shared goals on the group side. Instead of Individual risk on the individual side, you get shared risk. You also, and this is the most famous of the group flow triggers, it's the first rule of improv, yes and. And interestingly, the group trigger research was done by a man named Keith Sawyer, who's at the University of North Carolina, and he was in Chicago at the University of Chicago studying under Csikszentmihalyi, and he started researching Second City. Second City Television is the comedy troupe that was the main feeder into Saturday Night Live. So he was doing improv comedy and a little bit of improv jazz research, and he was videotaping sessions. And he was looking for, for example, in comedy, like the moment that like, Everybody sort of came together and the level of funny as measured by audience reaction, among other things, just goes through the roof, right? Really good sign that people are in group flow is when the level of creativity goes through the roof. So he sets out to measure all this stuff and he videotapes all of it. And then he does frame by frame analysis, painstaking, painstaking analysis, working backwards to these moments and trying to figure out the hell is going on, right? Like what's driving these moments? So what they also find is Yes, and the first rule of improv is maybe one of the most important group flow triggers. And yes, and sort of works on our selfishness, right? We pay more attention to shit when we're involved in it. So yes, and means that whatever I say, you build on top of it, right? Conversations are additive is yes, and. So if you were doing improv theater and you come to me and say, Stephen, hey, there's a blue elephant in the bathroom. And I say, shut the hell up. No, there's not. Well, that's not very funny and the story's not going anywhere, right? Like, but suddenly if I'm like, come to me, Stephen, there's a blue elephant bathroom. Holy crap, I hope he's not using up all my toilet paper. Well, now we've got the beginning of something that could get somewhat vaguely interesting. Yes, and it goes somewhere. It's additive. And by the way, for those people who are trying to produce group flow in brainstorming sessions, this doesn't mean, as the research consistently shows, that you can't criticize. You absolutely can criticize, but you have to find something to build upon. Because if you just tear somebody down, they're going to get defensive and they're going to not pay as much attention. You've got to give them a window to build them up. We also see close 
listening. This is active listening, right? I'm, I'm not thinking about the cool, neat thing I'm going to say next, my witty repartee. I'm completely listening to what you have to say. I'm actively listening. Autonomy, a sense of control. This shows up both on the individual side and on the group trigger side. And interestingly, this is some research that Chick Set Me High did on attention starting way back in 1975. Autonomy, I mean, quite simply, when we're driving the bus, we pay more attention to where it's going. It's not fancier than that. But what Chick Set Me High has noticed is that autonomy is a huge driver of attention, right? As, as he pointed out, you can definitely get slaves or factory workers to do the work you want done. What you cannot get them to do is to pay full attention to the work that they want done, right? Autonomy matters. Blending egos matters. Familiarity. And what familiarity means is you have a shared language, right? You speak that same sort of shorthand with one another in the group. Equal participation, open communication. These are all the 20 group flow triggers. This is sort of the high performance toolkit. You want more flow in your life? These are the tools to reach for. And I'll go into more detail in a second, but I really want to emphasize this because we are going to talk about technological hacks for flow and meditation and things like that to come. And we've obviously, there are pharmacological possibilities that already exist and there are more that are coming. The reason I like these triggers so much is I don't want to have to depend on a substance or a technology to be in a state of optimal performance. Optimal performance sounds like the kind of thing that I might need to do on my own when I need to do it, right? So I like the psychological triggers because they're totally portable. They go everywhere with me and I can work with them. And some of them are really simple to work with. So let me give you a, a, a couple more examples here. Complete concentration in the present moment, right? That's the most important flow trigger, individual group. So when I go into organizations, the very first thing I do is I tell people, if you can't hang a sign in door that says, fuck off, I'm flowing, you're sunk. You can't do this work, right? What the research shows is you want to maximize flow, 90 to 120 minutes of uninterrupted concentration. This is why I get up to write at 4 o'clock in the morning. I write from 4 to 8 o'clock in the morning because my cell phone's off, my phone's off. My internet connection, unless I'm doing research, is severed. It's pitch black in my office. I don't even have lights in my actual office. And I write in focus view. It is literally me and the words. That's the only thing. Complete concentration in the present moment. And now I want to talk a little bit more about the challenge skills balance, right? I said earlier, this is the most important of flow's triggers. It's often called the golden rule of flow. The reminder, we pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge of the task at hand slightly exceeds our skill set. You want to stretch, but not snap. Emotionally, we say flow sits near the midpoint of boredom, not enough stimulation here, and anxiety. Whoa, way too much stimulation, right? Not on that midpoint exactly, maybe a little off of it, right? This is interesting. So if you are a shyer person, a little meeker, a little more afraid of risk, challenge to go sweet spot is going to be tough because you're outside your comfort zone. You have to push past your comfort zone to get there. But for top performers, for type A types, their problem with the challenge skills balance is it seems too small. They take on challenges that are you know, 30 times, 40 times, 50 times greater than they need to. And as a result, lock themselves out of the very state they need for that level of high performance. And by the way, the secret is not don't set those huge, large goals. Those huge, large goals are great. In fact, motivation theory tells us that you get a 20, 25% boost in motivation simply by setting a high, hard goal, right? Set those goals, but chunk them down, small but manageable. This is what I'm going to do today. Now, by the way, this channel between anxiety and boredom, it's the flow channel. The flow channel is also the Erks Dobson curve, which is also what Wilhelm Wundt discovered way back when, when he went looking for the perfect point of bitterness in beer. So remember my point when I started this stuff out where I said there's really nothing that we knew in the 1870s that we haven't learned since again and again and again and again. This is a clear example of that. Now, 
interestingly, and this is a little bit in Rise of Superman, and I think it's worth talking about a little bit. Chick sent me high, and a Google mathematician sat down a couple of years ago, and they wanted to know, could you put an actual number on the ratio between challenge and skills? You know, could you identify that? And they came up with 4%. They said, we think to maximize the challenge skills balance, the challenge needs to be about 4% greater than your skill set. And we took that number into the Flow Genome Project, and a bunch of different researchers on our team have been poking and prodding at it for a couple of years. And the crazy thing is it seems to hold. And I'll give you one example. So what the hell is 4%? How the hell do you measure it? I don't know. One way we did it is downhill mountain biking, where there are fixed obstacles on the course, right? There's a, this is a 12 foot gap jump. This is a 20 foot wall ride, right? And so you could measure where people were right now. Like, what are you capable of doing? What's the, right? And you could get actual numbers and then you could work from that. And what we did, we did that. And I'll just tell you my experience because this was a very inaccurate, just let's see if there's a there, there kind of study. My experience is this. Typically in a given mountain biking, downhill mountain biking season, for me, it starts in June and it ends in October. And I will get a big, huge, powerful flow state early on. Somewhere day four, five, or six. It's usually the day that I get used to the fact that I'm going so goddamn fast downhill that I'm no longer terrified that I can start to work with the speed. That tends to produce, like the novelty and excitement of that tends to produce a lot of flow. And then you can plateau for a really long period of time. And maybe I'll get another flow state sort of at the end of the summer. And often what happens in that gap is like the heightened skills that I got in flow in that early session, I spend the whole summer developing and learning how to do without flow. And after I've learned how to do everything that I could do in flow at the start of the summer out of flow, they come, all these skills come together again and I get another big flow state and I level up, right? So it's a couple of flow states, big, long plateau, and then some more flow states at the end. Now, this has been my experience as an action sport athlete and a downhill mountain biker for a decade. When I was trying to push every time I went out riding by 4%, 4%, 4% every time, and I just stayed right there. And sometimes, most of the time, this meant dialing back my ambition, Right keeping what I found is that I was dropping into flow almost every time I went out there and that there was no plateau. It was flow state after flow state after flow state after flow state. And I made more progress over one summer than I had in years of mountain biking. So I thought that was really, really cool. So just to give you a sense of what is the challenge skills balance sort of look like in your world? How would you apply this in your world? I guess gave you a mountain bike example. Let me give you another example from me as a writer. So when I start out a book, I write 500 words a day. In the middle, I write 750. And at the end, I write 1,000. That's my goal. And that's because it is challenging, right? For me, 300 words, 200 words, like I'm going to do that automatically. It's not going to take anything. But 500, 600, that starts to get difficult, starts to get challenging. When I'm writing non-fiction stuff. A couple of my books have memoir-ish layers to them. So with memoirs, I always know that I'm riding the sweet spot. I feel like I'm revealing a little too much of myself. I'm telling a little too much of the truth, right? Then I know I'm in that sweet spot. So that's my own stuff from writing. Toyota is fabulous. Kaizen. You probably heard about Kaizen. This is their fabled manufacturing process, right? That they introduced in the nineties and suddenly productivity went through the freaking roof. What did they do? They upped the challenge skills balance. They said, anybody who works for Toyota, if you work on our line, you can improve our line. In fact, that's your job. Your job is to not only do your job, it's also to try to figure out how we can do our job better collectively. What does this do? It ups the challenge level. Suddenly, they're not an automaton doing assembly line work. Suddenly you've got some autonomy. The challenge skills balance is involved. Boom, lots of flow. Facebook has another one. They've got a hack a month program. This is really cool. They realize that most people don't usually take the job they most want, right? You Oftentimes you take the job you can get and maybe there's some other job in the company that you really want, right? So the problem is when you take the job you can get, it's probably not in your challenge skills sweet spot. 
And a lot of organizations don't let you move laterally, horizontally. You have to stay in your job and you have to work your way up and work your way up, right? Or something worse happens, like this happens all the time in sales, right? You'll get salesmen who are really, 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 really good at their job and maybe they don't like it, but it was the job they could get. Now the boss doesn't want to move them because they're making them too much money, right? Facebook says, no, 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 we can solve this problem. We've got our Hack-A-Month. Hack-A-Month says if you worked here a year, you can audit any department. You can move horizontally. You were an engineer. Why not move into marketing for a month? You can audit marketing for a month. And if you like it, you can petition the company on the back end and stay there. And you would think, right, like some dude coming from engineering into marketing isn't going to have that much of an impact on marketing. Turns out that's not the case. Why? Lots of novelty, lots of complexity in that challenge skills sweet spot. Lots of flow. You end up making a big contribution. So there's three different ways to sort of employ the challenge skills balance as well. Immediate feedback. We talked a little bit about this earlier. We talked about how it shows up in action sports, right? You either set that ski on top of the kawar, the ski edge is there, or you're on a face first that slide to the bottom. That is immediate feedback, right? Now, we see this, you probably have seen this in your day-to-day -day life. If you work anywhere near computers, you probably know about the Agile software movement, right? This is a software movement that says, don't release a product with thousands and thousands of features. Release a product with three or four features and get feedback and make it a better product, right? So Gmail, for example, was built this way. When Google introduced Gmail, it showed up with four features. They use this agile process. This agile process is also a high flow process. You're getting more feedback, right? This is also why you see rapid experimentation at the core of every skunk works. Skunk works are those isolated pods of innovation. It's basically how every big company has innovated. The most effective innovation technique in the past 150 years are the skunk works. This is Walmart. This is Steve Jobs when he built the Macintosh. In fact, he left the company that he founded, right, to establish a skunk works. He rented a restaurant behind the Good Earth restaurant in Palo Alto, uh, California, and flew a pirate flag over it and said, it's better to be a pirate than join the Navy, right? This was his skunk works, and they did a ton of rapid experimentation there, right, because you get immediate feedback. In my own writing, for example, you never get feedback from editors. So I get feedback once or twice over the course of a story or a book, you know, in big chunks that's worthwhile. Well, that's amazing, but that's not enough feedback for flow. So there's somebody on my staff who reads almost everything I write whenever I write it so I can get that immediate feedback. And by the way, there is a reason I just walked you through these three triggers, complete concentration, immediate feedback, and the challenge skills balance. And this is, we did a bunch of creativity research at the Flow Genome Project, and we found that if you're looking to increase creativity, these are the three triggers that have the best impact. And I figure in the modern world, everybody's looking to increase creativity at least a little. So now you know how to do it with Flow, right? And we see this stuff getting more and more. We talked earlier about how we're seeing you know, the altered state economy growing, how we're seeing this stuff starting to go mainstream, flow in organizations, right? Flow in business. You can import this stuff. There are small, medium, and large ways to do it. I'll give you a simple example in the small category, Patagonia, right? Outdoor retailer, always tops list of American companies, best place to work in America. Patagonia is always up there. Patagonia is a company that was built around flow ideas and flow triggers. And they really focused mostly on autonomy. And autonomy of Patagonia is actually, it's not even a ton of autonomy. They let employees make their own schedule. And then the Patagonia headquarters is right on the Pacific. And it's founded by a big surfer, Yvonne Chouinard. And he has one rule at Patagonia. Let my people go surfing. If you work at Patagonia and there are waves breaking outside, you can leave your desk and go surfing. Why? Why would you do that? Well, autonomy itself, right? A little bit of a flow trigger, but we know surfing, 
packed with novelty, complexity, unpredictability, risk, creativity. It's packed with flow triggers, high flow activity. And we know from the McKinsey study, employees in flow, 500% more productive than normal. So what does Patagonia care? If you hang up the phone and leave a meeting to go surfing because you're going to come back, you're going to be so much more productive, right? If you want to see another one, this is pretty funny. So this is uh, Amazon. Amazon decided that they wanted a higher flow environment and the trigger they wanted to play with was yes and. And Jeff Bezos just said it was so easy to say no in a corporate environment, right? Not to say yes and that they have what they call an institutional no policy, which is if you want to say no, if you're a manager at Amazon, you want to say no to somebody's idea, you got to write a two page paper about why you said no and post it on the company website, right? So we're starting to see this stuff introduced into companies at really basic levels. It's there in education. So Montessori education, when they go out and they look at the most effective forms of education they can find, Montessori always tops the list. Why? Well, Montessori education is built around a number of fundamental flow triggers. First of all, self-directed learning, autonomy, right? And um, this is really important, by the way. So kids, when you talk about challenging the, ch the challenge skills balance, it's interesting. If you go to a child or teenagers even with a challenge, if you go to them with a challenge, they will see it as a threat to themselves and will not drive flow. They will not take it as a challenge. It will be registered as a threat. If they generate the challenge themselves, autonomously self-directed, they can view it as a challenge. So if you're working with the challenge skills balance in education with children, this is a real issue. They seem to have more of a fixed mindset somehow about challenge and tends to cause some problems. So anyways, autonomy and Montessori education. Also, uninterrupted concentration. Montessori education is built around 90 to 120 minutes of uninterrupted concentration. And finally, deep embodiment. Montessori education is often called embodied education, right? This is the very place. If you don't want to read about the windmill and you want to go out and build one, Montessori education is the place to do it. So that's a meeting example of how these triggers are being imported at the meeting level. Of course, when you're talking about deep cultures of innovation like the action sport athletes that we talked about in the 90s. Well, now you see an entire culture built upon all of the triggers, right? You've got all the individual triggers and then you've got the group flow triggers, shared risk. You know, these guys are going into the back country together. You get groups of female skiers going helicopter skiing together, right? This is shared risk, shared goals, et cetera, et cetera really high flow environments. But the point is, of course, as I said, it's not just action adventure sport athletes, it's not even just skunk works, right? A friend of mine who was one of the original architects of the internet pointed out to me not too long ago that all the basic activities that lead to today's high tech Silicon Valley revolution, circuit design, software design, and network design, they all require laser focused attention and produce flow and doing all those tasks well without the state isn't possible. So in other words, if you're looking for a non-athletic example, the kind of revolution that occurs when a lot of people start harnessing flow on a regular basis, Silicon Valley is not a bad place to start. Next thing I want to tell you about these flow triggers, um, and this is really, really fascinating to me, is they're easy to work with. And I would have bet against this. In fact, if you go back into the 90s in flow research, you will find that this state is really hard to train up. And what shifted, though, is in the thousands, we started working backwards from the neuroscience, the mechanism. And it turns out that you can, using these triggers, you can train this stuff up really easily. I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, the Flow Genome Project did a joint uh, learning project with Google, and we took about 70 Googlers from all over the company. So this was, you know, people out of marketing and coding, but some people out of facilities and groundskeepers and whatever. And we trained them up in four high performance basics. And I mean, you know, like sleep hygiene, get enough sleep at night kind of basics and the use of about four flow triggers over the course of six weeks. And on the back end, we saw a 35 to 80% increase in flow. That's incredible. To put it in context, when McKinsey did that original research, they pointed out 
And this was actually a number of chicks at me high had come up with. Chicks at me high said, noticed that about people spend about 5% of their work life in flow, often without noticing it, right? These are states of micro flow. You don't even know what's happening. If we could increase that to 20%, so 15 percentage point boost, this is what McKinsey discovered, overall workplace productivity would double. So earlier I said to you, flow state percentage, the amount of time employees spend in flow is one of the most important management metrics for the 21st century. This is why. The next thing that is really, really cool is we are starting to get techno-mediated flow. We're starting to get techno-mediated meditation. There's tons and tons of meditation apps that are out there. I should tell you, by the way, with all those meditation apps, that as far as Daniel Goldman and Richard Davidson can tell in altered traits, nobody has done any follow-up research to find out if their thing is actually working. They tend to point at a lot of other meditation research, but very few of these individual meditation apps have been studied. And I will tell you the exact same thing is true. There are a lot of technologies out there. There are a lot of people claiming their technology is going to tune your heart this way or that way, and it's going to get you into flow. They're lying. And the reason they're lying is they're all single correlate hypotheses, right? So yes, there is probably some heart rate variability signature for flow, but it's only important in conjunction with six or seven different neurobiological physiological markers, right? What has happened across the boards is people have built technologies that are capable of measuring one thing, and then they want to claim that the one thing they're measuring is perfect mindfulness or perfect flow or perfect whatever. And what it's really perfect for is taking the money that's in your wallet and putting it in their wallet, which is a neat trick. tends to work very, very well. And we call it capitalism. That said, what we are finding is you can do this work in flow. For example, transcranial magnetic stimulation, right? You can send a weak magnetic pulse through the prefrontal cortex. You can knock out the prefrontal cortex. You can artificially induce a 20 to 40 minute flow state. In fact, they are now doing this with radar operators. One of the reasons is when you're in flow, we pay more attention to incoming information with radar operators. That's salience, right? Radar operators, it's really easy to tune out the same signal that you've been paying attention to for too long, right? This is just what the brain does. It's habituation, right? This is why William James says you can walk across a room being bombarded by information, but it's crap if you're a radar operator. But if you put a radar operator in flow, pattern recognition, which is exactly what they're doing, goes way up. Salience goes way up. So this is now standard operating procedure. I talked earlier about the University of Sydney experiment where they artificially induce flow and gave people the nine-dot problem. This is what they did. I also, on the meditative side of this, I recently got a chance to try out ultrasound, where they used ultrasound to knock out my PCC, which is one of the brain structures implicated in the default mode network. Now, I will tell you that I wasn't all that impressed. Rather than just sort of quieting my default mode network, my experience with that particular technology was it made me stupid, and I didn't love it. And I will say that Tim Ferriss years ago, kind of biohacker extraordinaire, pointed out to me that you can do transcranial magnetic and transcranial direct and all these technologies that they're using to knock out the prefrontal cortex and artificially induce transient hyperfrontality. You can do it with, you know, a car battery and some wires. You really can, but you get it wrong, you're going to make yourself stupid for quite a while. We're also, by the way, starting to see, as I said, the same thing is happening in meditation, right? Years ago, Richie Davidson, he did all that work. He wired up those monks and found all kinds of cool stuff. Now we have neurofeedback devices where we can record the brainwaves of a meditating monk with 34,000 hours of cushion time, and we can use their brainwaves to steer in a neurofeedback kind of way. And while there's a ton of work left to do, it does seem that we're starting to be able to shortcut some of the procedures, right? And there's at-home versions, right? Like companies like Think and Halo are making brain training devices and mood altering devices that are along these ways. As I said earlier, I, out of all this stuff, 
I will prefer the psychological triggers for flow because I like their portability. I like how effective they are. And I think most of the technology right now is weak sauce, but it's still going on. Um, and it's going to keep growing and keep growing. So what's weak sauce today is going to start becoming really, really powerful. Now, with all of that said, I want to wrap us up by going all the way back to the beginning. Let's talk about what Nietzsche said. Let's talk about what James said. Let's talk about what we learned early on. Let's see what they were right about, what they were wrong about, and what's interesting there. So first of all, remember that Nietzsche had essentially four fundamental points, right, with a caveat. His first point, start with a big goal, a core passion or purpose, right? And this is how you get past the limits of self and culture. What do we know from positive psychology? What do we know from flow research? Absolutely smart thing to do. Do we find art and creativity and self-expression a way to overcome world weariness, nihilism, and the herd mentality? Well, of course we do, right? This isn't that big of a big deal now. Now we've got an entrepreneurial individualist culture where it thrives on this kind of stuff. Big deal back when Nietzsche started, but now it's actually, you know, lionized in tech culture and things like that. Rausch flow 